Yeah, it happens. All right. Just to annoy Haley, I'm going to add another untitled page and not label it. Because I don't ever go back to it. I'm, I just start a new one to start a day for the video, and then I don't ever go back to it. What if you wanted to go back to it for some reason? Like, what if I came in, asked you questions about something we did on Wednesday, then on I, a specific day, and wanted to refer specifically to something you wrote down on the, or on the video? Then I would the go to the video and just get to that, and we just go to that point. Because the videos are all labeled by day, if you notice that on the online. Yeah, but if you go to the video, then you can't like write on like, what you already have written. Yeah. The dates are inside of them. I could find it eventually. They're all in order. <laughs> I'd find it eventually. You know how many people have actually came in and asked me to do that? None. None. <laughs> well, I'm going to be... You're just going to do it to irritate me, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> There's such things as decreasing perpetuity? No. Well, not, with, not arithmetically decreasing, no. You could do geometrically decreasing. But arithmetically decreasing wouldn't make sense because eventually you're going to hit zero. Oh, yeah, you I know. Are we going to What's that? Geometrically decreasing. That's exactly what we're going to do right here. Is that whole calculus? No, it, well, I mean, you have to hit some of the series, so. Yeah. I don't like those. Oh my gosh, why don't we also find I'm it? not complaining, I'm just not good at it. It's fun. Dr. Joe, how's your ball break? Good. I went to Vegas, so that's fun. Oh, do you want any money? Saw Barry Manilow and saw Gwen Stefani. You guys ran a race too? Yeah, 45K. How'd that go? Going well. Did you get a gold in the dark medal? I did not, but I did get a ribbon for third place. Nice. Well, that's so oh, we got a medal too. I don't know if it was in the dark, but I didn't try it. I only knew it was in the dark because Dom it, got one last year and it closed. In the dark? <laughs> and also, it was dark outside. So I'm like, home from dark. <laughs> cool. Um, was it warm out or was it cold? It was warm out there. It was 80 in the, in the afternoon. So. Man, it's not bad because it was 50s in the morning. So. You go to the casino? Of course. What else would I go to Vegas for? <laughs> run the we stay at Sam's Town. Well, I was there receiving the KOA in the Circus Circus Park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have KOA RV parks. They have RV parks all over the place. Yeah. It's just funny. It's like in the parking lot of the Circus Circus. Yeah. Yep. It's the same thing on Sam's Town. There's a damn one, too. Which is also a KOA. <laughs> all right. So let's look at these problems. Let's actually go to the big packet. Because that's a little bit set up a little more straightforwardly to start with before we use some of the more complicated ones. So I'm not going to do a big lecture on this. We're just going to set it up and figure it out. So what's that? I said that's why I said I forgot we had the big packet and Haley said that we had homework from it. Yeah. yeah, that's why we had a pattern dying and stuff that we should do a fifteen from chapter eight. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, so let's see how this stuff with increasing um, increasing annuities works with geometrically increasing payments or decreasing because it doesn't matter. It's the same principle. Let's look at number two in chapter 10. Did you lose your packets? Yeah, I think so. I was doing homework last night and I had papers all over. Um... Oh, wait, I think I know where it is. Maybe? Yep. Okay, cool. Thanks, Katie. All right. So we've got, if I think about a time diagram, we've got these payments. The first one is going to be 1.04 at time one, and I know it's at time one because because the problem says a perpetuity immediate. And then it'll be 1.04 squared at time two, 1.043 uh, cubed at time three, 1.04 to the fourth at time four, and so on up the line. 
All right, so this is an example of a geometric uh, progression because at each point, each payment is a certain percentage above the previous one. That's number two in chapter 10. Sorry. But I said that. You probably did. I did say it. And Haley's shaking her head at me. What did you say? You paused. Haley was shaking her head disapprovingly at me. It was probably at me. Oh, it was great. Got it. Got it. Got it. All right. So this one was our, they told you what the payments were, but a lot of times you'll see the problem will say each payment is 4% greater than the previous payment, which would mean, of course, you would multiply by 1.04. If it's 4% greater, you take 4% of it and then add that payment value to it, right? So it's just going to be multiplied by 1.04 each time. Or if it said it was 3% less, you would multiply by 0.97 each time. So that's how this gets set up. So we see this geometric progression. So if I want to do the present value, well, I've got to take this 1.04, I've got to move it back one spot, right? So it multiply by what? The V. The second one will have to multiply by V squared, third one, V cubed, and so on down the line, right? So our present value will be 1.04 V, 1.04 V squared, 1.04, oops, 1.04 squared v squared, 1.04 cubed v cubed, and so on, right? All right, so the whole point of this is to get the present value, of course, but notice that we have a geometric series because I can think of this as... 1.04v plus, and then I could pull out the squared, 1.04v squared, the whole thing squared, 1.04v cubed, and so on down the line. So I have that same multiplier, if you will, just being raised to the higher and higher powers each time, right? So we have that geometric series. For an infinite geometric series that starts at 1, so if I think about this over to the side, if I start at 1 and then go to r and then go to r squared and then r cubed and so on down the line, what does that add up to? The 1 over 1 minus r, right? Correct. <laughs> right? We get this for our geometric series, right? thing to remember is that this first term here needs to be a 1 if we're going to use this particular version of the formula, okay? So in this particular geometric series, I don't start at one, right? So at least the way that I always attack these problems is to factor out a common factor so the series left starts at one. So what do I need to factor out of everything? 1.04v. Yeah, 1.04v. So that will leave us with a one plus a 1.04v plus a 1.04 v squared, so on up the line. And now this thing in parentheses, why do I keep missing where I'm supposed to put that exponent? Every time, keep putting it in the wrong spot. What is playing the role of our, our R in this formula, or in this, what's inside the parentheses? What's playing the role of R in this geometric series? The 1.04v, right? So if I plug it in here, I get 1 over 1 minus 1.04v, right? So this will be times 1 over 1 minus 1.04v. And then we can, should be able to simplify this because we know what v is, right? In this case, it told us the interest rate was 8%. So our v will be what? Over 1.08. Good, 1 over 1.08. So if I do that, 1.04 divided by 1.08. So your 1.04v is approximately 0 0.9630. Yeah. Okay. So your fraction part is 27. 
apparently. That's what I got. So I got 0 0.9630. Missed my six. And this part was 27. So I got 26. Maybe exactly 26, but. Okay. Okay. Oh um, well, yeah, it should be it should be an exact value because one point oh four, and one point oh eight are both are both terminating decimals. So let's just click everything out. So I guess it wasn't approximately. It should have been equal, actually equal to. That process makes sense though. So when I when I personally do these problems, there's a couple of things that have formulas. There's one that's called the dividend growth model, and I'll mention it here in a little bit, what we mean by that. But when I do these problems, I, I just don't bother trying to memorize any formula. I just write down the geometric series and know the geometric series formula. Yeah, Are you going to need to know anything other than the geometric series, any other series? The, ol the only other possible one that will pop up later is the derivative of your geometric series. So if you've got, so if I think about this formula is that, right? And if I do the derivative, on this side we get nx to the n minus 1. And on the right-hand side you would get 1 minus x squared. That one might pop up later when we do duration. We'll talk about duration later. Yeah. Yeah, those are I think those are the only two. What about the Taylor series? The Taylor series comes up in the duration. And then uh, really we'll, we're gonna say the word Taylor series and talk a little, a little bit about it, but you never go past the second degree term anyway. Ever. <laughs> you just have to do a Taylor series expansion with two terms? Nope. You don't have to do that. It's just you use it to show that the what the equivalence is and just to show that it works. Why don't you have to go beyond the second term ever? Yeah, not in this not in this class we won't. So all right. So let's see if we get uh, the only thing that will change on these is if it's a an actual honest to goodness annuity and not a perpetuity. Because our geometric series has a different, slightly different form. Not much of a different form. But again, I always make it start at one so that my formula works out the same every time. So the important part with a finite geometric series, if you start at one, what you subtract off in the numerator, the power of the r is one more than the last thing that's in your sum. So if this were r to the ninth, you would have an r to the tenth in your sum, in your formula on the right hand side. It's always one more. And you can see then where the geometric series formula, infinite geometric series formula comes from, right? If r is between negative one and one, which is what you talk about in calculus, then I take the limit as n goes to infinity, that goes to zero. So that's where you get the one over one minus r. Yes, Kim? So, wait, so then when <coughs> the last term is nine, then you need r is ten? Yeah, yep, yep, it's always one bigger. Because like the first period is one, and the last period is ten, so it's not the v's or something? So, yeah, it would be like a v of e squared, yeah. So let's see if we can do another example here. <laughs> Yeah, let's say it look let's look at number three. So it's not a perpetuity in this type case. Annual profit comes in at the end of each uh, year for 20 years. They assume that the profits are going to go up by two and a half percent a year. The first payment is ten thousand dollars. So what they mean by that is the first profit at the end of the first year should be ten thousand dollars. Number three on uh, the big packet, big packet in chapter ten of the big packet. It wants to know the present value, assuming an annual effective interest rate of six percent. So if I think about time value diagram again. 
I know it goes for 20 years. I'm not even going to bother in the end. At time one, we've got a $10,000 payment, right? What happens at time two? We have the 10,000 times. How do I show a 2.5% growth by a multiplier? Again, 1.025. And then at time three, we'll have. Good. The important part, of course, is if I'm going to use the finite geometric series formula, I need to know what this looks like. I need to know what the last term is, right? All right, I'm, I'm going to try to make this, again, I'm going to try to make this geometric series fit my pattern where it starts at 1 and then ends with some r to a power, right? So I need to know what that last power is going to be. So at time 20, what should be the exponent on the 1.025? 19. 19, good. Okay. So again, it wants this present value, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So what do I need to multiply each of these things by? So that first payment, the 10,000, I need to multiply by V. And the second payment, we need to multiply by V squared. V squared. The third payment, need to multiply by V cubed. And then the very last payment, we'll multiply by What? Yeah, the 20th. Good. Again, the reason why I'm concentrating on the last payment is because I need to know what that exponent on that last term is going to be to be able to apply my formula. That's why I'm focusing on the last payment. Does that make sense? Because again, in our geometric series formula, we want this to start at 1, and then we're interested in what that last power is. So to get this to start at 1, what do I need to factor out? 10,000 V. <clears throat> if we factor out 10,000 V, our first term is 1. Our second term is 1.025 V, because we pulled out a V, right? The second term will be? Okay, 1.025v, the whole thing squared, right? Because if we pull out a v in the C, third term, makes a v squared and a 1.025 squared, so I can factor, I can just pull the two out, the squared out. All right, so what does that make your very last term? 1.025 and v, all of that. Good. And now this looks a heck of a lot like the previous one we did, doesn't it? Same formula, different day. That's the saying, right? That's true. <laughs> SFD. SFD. Yeah. All right. So now this is a finite geometric series in this case, rather than an infinite one. The 1,000, excuse me, the 10,000 V stays in front. What's it going to get multiplied by? Do the X power? What's the X up here? Yeah, good. It's always one more than the last power here, right? And then it's over 1 minus 1.025v. And at this point, it's just a matter of getting your calculator correctly, which this shouldn't be all that hard to put in your calculator. Can I get an answer? No. Did you say one thirty nine 
734? <coughs> yeah. yeah. I got this one. Okay. I'll buy that. Sure. Hey, going good. We got triple confirmation here. <laughs> All right. This okay? So, um, let's talk about this stock, this growth dividend model. It's not anything that's a big deal. I don't ever remember the formula. It's just, it pops up. So, all right. So the idea behind stock dividends is that if you own stock, you kind of assume that the company is going to be solvent forever <coughs> and that somehow you should have growth of your dividends. You want the business to grow, right? So the idea is it's a way to price stock. If you know the current interest rate and you know the projected growth rate, of those dividends, you should have a value of that perpetuity that should be equivalent to what the price of the stock is, right? You're not going to pay more than, you're not going to pay more than what you would expect to be getting back in dividends for the stock forever, right? That's a dumb way to buy a stock. If you don't expect to get the money back over time, there's no reason to buy the stock at that price. You're also, from the flip side of things, not going to sell the stock for less than what you would be expecting to get back in the dividends in the future. It would be also stupid to sell a stock if you're thinking about it just from investment purposes, right? You don't want to sell it too low and you don't want to buy it too high. So one way to price, there's other ways to price stocks if you decide to go on to take a mathematical finance class where you can actually talk about stock pricing, options pricing. But there's other ways to value stock, and that's one way to do it. You have projected growth of dividends, and you know current interest rate, so you can figure out the present value of that perpetuity. Okay. So think about if, let's suppose that, that the current interest rate is I, and the projected growth rate of your dividends is G. Okay. So we can think about, again, your time value diagram. And hopefully I set this up in the correct way, because otherwise the formula will come off by a little bit, but we'll pretend like I know what I'm doing. All right, let's say your first dividend is given to you by, I believe the book uses DIV, but I've seen DIV in other texts, so we'll just use DIV to start with. If it grows by a growth rate of G, then what am I gonna multiply the DIV by to get the second one? One plus G, the next one will be one plus G squared, and so on into infinity, right? It's the same stuff we did just with letters as opposed to numbers, isn't it? Is this, a problem there? this is deriving a formula which will lead into the problems, into the stock valuation problems. It, it's it, but it's more practice with the kind of the problems that we've been doing, right? It's the same setup, isn't it? Yeah, I was just wondering where it's coming from. Yeah, it's coming from the six through nine on that page. All right. So if we do present value, what do I need to multiply each of these things by? I would multiply your first dividend by V and your second one by V squared and so on up the line, right? We agree? Then we can factor what out of every term? Ooh, can I get a one plus G out of the first term? Yeah. Oh, j just the dividend, right? Okay. And then we'll be left with 
one plus one plus GV and then a one plus GV squared and so on up the line, right? Yeah. All right. So what does that infinite geometric series sum to? Okay, good. Now that doesn't look like a pretty formula, but it gets better. I promise. What's V equal to? One over one plus I, right? So if I rewrite this as one over one plus I, I can think about thinking that one plus I and distributing it to both terms, right? You agree? Well, what's, if I think this is one over one plus I and I hit this second term with it, what's gonna happen to this V? But we write this as one over one plus i and running it through. It's, it's just going to cancel it, right? It's going to go away, isn't it? So we're left with a div on the top, one plus i, because I still have to distribute it to both terms, correct? So when I take the one plus i times the one, I get a one plus i. When I take it times the second term, I just get a minus one plus g. And this turns into your first dividend over i minus g. So this is your stock valuation model. Now, for that to work, what do we need to assume about i and g? Even more than that, to make it actually even more for i. Yeah, g better be less than i, right? You're exactly right, they can't be mistaken, they get zero. But it also, from a stock pricing standpoint, doesn't make any sense. If your growth rate is higher than the interest rate, then you're going to be getting a negative present value, right? It doesn't make any sense. So we need to assume that our growth rate is less than our interest rate. So what is the growth rate? Is it how much the stock grows by? This one should be the way, whatever, yeah, whatever you're anticipating the stock, uh, the gro the stock grows by each year, which would typically be given to you or estimated by previous years, because you would have that data. So where does the interest rate come from? Yeah, that would be prevailing interest rates. Whatever that happens to be. So probably whatever prime is. This is just for stock. It works for anything. It's, it, it'll work for, it'll work for anything for an infinite geometric theory. Where your first payment. It would work for you have to be a little bit careful. It would work for well, it works for anything that we've done so far. For infinite. It has to be infinite geometric series, right? That big one, but we could have applied if this had been a perpetuity here, we could have applied the same thing. It would have been ten thousand over what we use for the interest rate in that problem eight. Is that right? No, for the previous one. Okay, so six. <laughs> I couldn't remember what the interest rate was. So if this were a perpetuity, you could have just done ten thousand over 0 0.06 minus 0 0.025. And that would be your answer. In the first one, you could have done something similar. In the first one that we did, your first payment was 1.04. So you would do 1.04 over, was that the one we used 8%? Yeah, okay. So then you would do 1.04 over 0.08 minus 0.04. And be done. I never remember the formula, so I would have to read it every time. Okay. I think you said this. Stock valuation is going to be perpetuity, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, it has to be perpetuity. Because you're you don't want to make the assumption that the business is going to go out of business. That would be that would be why it would if you were assumed that it would stop, that would assume that the business stops. So you don't want to value stock that way because it'll plummet. <laughs> That would be a bad way to value stock. I assume you're going out of business. Well, then no one's going to want to buy it. Your stock is worthless. Assume you're going out of business in the next year. Yeah. So, yeah. So, it's going to be, has to be perpetuity in this case. 
So let's see if we can apply the formula to one of these problems. Which of 6 through 9 do you want to do? 7. 7? Okay, sure, why not? <laughs> All right, so this one's, yeah, this one's just a little bit different, but it's not bad. It says the company announced that it plans to increase its dividend by 1% each quarter forever. That is weird, because that's not... All right, so that, uh, that talks about some words that we haven't talked about yet. Let's just see if we can value the stock. And then, then we'll talk about what the opportunity cost of equity capital is. Okay. All right, so let's see how you, would, how you would value it this stock. So what the opportunity cost of equity capital is, is it's asking you to figure out what the interest rate is. No. So we should write that out. Opportunity cost of equity capital is just the interest rate. No, we'll just I will tell you what the interest rate is on a test. So I think that's more I think that's more of a finance topic than it would be on this particular exam anyway. I think somebody was just trying to give you another way to look at the problem. So what they're talking about is that there's costs that come up with adding stocks and those kinds of things to your business. So they're trying to figure out what the implied interest rate is by what their dividend is, which would give them what the interest rate, the prevailing interest rate, or I guess technically worth would be to people for these particular dividends. So anyway, it's a more of a financial topic that would be getting into in more of a corporate finance class than what we're going to talk about. But we're just trying to get, we're just trying to figure out what the interest rate is. Okay. Uh, you'll, if you do, well, if you take corporate finance, you should be talking more about those kinds of things anyway. Outside of my scope. All right. So anyway, so according to this, sorry, what's that? We love finance. You love finance? Yay, good, I'm glad. All right, so according to this formula, one thing that you have to remember for be able to get this formula work to work, it assumes that your dividend, your first dividend is coming at the end of the period, right? Where did it, when did it just say the first dividend was paid? Immediately, right? It just issued, correct? So if it just issued a dollar fifty dividend, what's going to be the next dividend in the line? Well, yeah, 1.01, right? So in this case, it should say the present value is a dollar fifty times 1.01, right? Because that's the next dividend. That's the time. That's the dividend at the end of the next period, right? Over I. I don't know. That's what we're trying to find. Minus G. What's G? 0.01. This is, this is just using our formula that we just created above, right? We multiply it by the 1.01 because that's the next one in the line, right? Okay? I don't know I, I know G. Do we know what the present value is? That's what they tell us the price of the stock is, correct? So we should be able to solve for I, I hope. Anybody get that number? I got 0 0.00006. What is it? That was what I got. <laughs> All right, so. Dang it, subtract 0.01, not added. I know, I did. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. You're gonna add it to this, aren't you? Alright, so what did the problem ask for? Interest rate as a for what time period? Uh, an effective annual rate of return. Okay, okay, effective annual rate of return. Is this an effective annual rate that we just found? I think it's. Uh, I think it's more like. I feel like you're asking the answers no. The, correct, I agree. If I'm asking the answers no, what is this rate? Quarterly. It's a quarterly rate, right? This is your quarterly rate because we did growth rate per quarter, right? The I and the G match in the formula by period. We agree? Right? This I and this G are both per period. We did growth rate of 1% per quarter. That I is a quarterly rate. So how do I change the quarterly rate to an effective rate? Annual effective rate. One plus that over four, all of that to one power equals one plus I. Okay. I agree I'm going to do one plus something to the fourth power. One plus zero. Yeah, 0206, right? I don't need to divide that by 4. That's already a quarterly rate, so I don't want to divide it by 4 again. The formula is 1 plus I4 over 4. This number that you've got here is I4 over 4. That's your quarterly rate, if you want to think about it that way. And then we would subtract 1, right, to get the actual percentage. What did you get? Okay, so four. What did you say? Four nine eight. Okay. So you get about eight and a half percent ish. Does that make sense? Again, this you can use this for perpetuities too. By the way. Harder to use for annuities. You can use it for annuities, but you'll still have a different thing, a different uh, piece in your numerator. Is there a reason that we don't need to add 150 to our present value since um, that 150 times 1.01 is our second treatment? No, the reason is that the, the 150 has already been paid to the stockholders. So if someone's going to buy the stock today, they don't expect that 150. Oh, okay. They expect the next dividend. Okay. If the div there are things that you have to do differently if the dividend is going to be paid later. Mm -hmm. So uh, for example, say that you sell your stock seven months into the year, then you should expect to get seven twelfths of the dividend and whoever you sell it to, you get five twelfths of the dividend even though they're going to get the whole thing. So if you sell your stock, you should incorporate that into your stock. Okay. But this one says that it specifically told you the dollar fifty had already been paid. If you're going to sell it, then you don't have to worry about the dollar fifty. It's yours already. And then the other person will have the stock for the entire period. Gotcha. So that's why we didn't have to incorporate it. That's a very good question. It was, it's stuff that you have to worry about if you were selling the stock. I know. Which... I think they've taken that stuff out of this example. So they don't do stuff with one last slide. I think that's right. I've, I've certainly read through that stuff before. I'm trying to remember if I've thought it before or not. But I, I think they've taken it out of this example. But that's a very good question because that's exactly the kind of stuff you would have to worry about if you're doing stock pricing. So if you were going to be a financial actuary, it would be stuff that you would worry about. All right? Is it okay? We'll just do questions and problems next time for test. Just let me know you're planning on coming in. You can do it Thursday or Friday. I don't care which. Are we reviewing Friday night? I was going to have class on Friday, but I didn't talk to you. Oh, okay. And you can ask me questions Friday. I was going to take the test on Thursday. No, no. But you're welcome to come ask me questions. I've done a couple of I guess I can stop the video too.